Today we're going to be talking about chapter 6, section 1, which cover of Hurley's Introduction to Logic, which covers translating statements and arguments into symbols. What we're going to be trying to do in this video is give you the tools you need to translate uh, first simple and progressively more complex statements into symbols because eventually we're going to be using our uh, using the symbolizations of these statements in equations to figure out truth value and validity and things like that. So we'll start simple. So the basic unit that we're going to be working with are simple statements. So a simple statement is a statement that does not contain any other statement as a component. It has one subject, one verb, and it's not negative. So let's take a look at some examples. Michael Moore wrote downsize this. So simple statement, a subject and a verb, it's not negative. And what we're going to be doing in this chapter when we see a simple statement is we're going to be picking a letter to stand in for it. We can pick whatever letter we want. Uh, an easy way to keep track of it, because again, we're going to get pretty complex pretty quickly, is to choose the uh, first letter of the subject or the first letter of the verb or the object. So in this case, M. So we have M stand in for Michael Moore wrote down size this. So whenever we see Michael Moore wrote down size this in a passage, we would just substitute this, the letter M for that. The sky is blue. We could substitute S for that. We have a governator for California. Governor. Uh, at this point, I should thank Michael McNellis for some of these political examples. So uh, this PowerPoint must have been written, uh, part of this PowerPoint must have been written some time ago. So we have a governator for California governor. We could substitute just G for that. So whenever we saw that simple statement, we would write a G. So simple statements are the basic units that we'll be working with. But simple statements can be combined with other statements in all sorts of different ways. Um, so the two basic tools we'll have are simple statements and the logical operators or logical connectors, connectives, which uh, give us ways to connect simple statements. So with the simple statements and the connectives, we can make compound statements. So for example, uh, it is not the case that Gray Davis won the recall. It is not the case that G. So we see here the simple statement, Gray Davis won the recall, is you see that occur in a compound statement. So it is not the case that Gray Davis won the recall. It is not the case that G. Or the Boston Red Sox will make it to the World Series if and only if they get smarter pitchers and coaches. So here we see a couple of simple statements. The first, the Boston Red Sox will make it to the World Series. The second, they get smarter pitchers and coaches. And they're combined by this phrase, if and only if. So B, if and only if S. Finally, if Apple introduces downloadable music, then Microsoft will soon follow. So again, we have two simple statements. Apple introduces downloadable music. That's either true or false, right? Microsoft will soon follow. That's either true or false. So we have two simple statements, subject and a verb, uh, and they're joined by this phrase, if then. So if A, then M. And now we'll uh, talk about those connecting phrases, and we'll have symbols for those connecting phrases. So the following is a list of the operators or connectives, uh, the symbols, the name, and the function that they serve. So the first, uh, we had earlier, um, it is not the case that Gray Davis won. Uh, we would capture that negation with the tilde operator. So the little squiggly line there, we call that a tilde. 
And that stands in for the English uh, words not, or the phrase, it is not the case that, or it is false that. So um, it is not the case that Gray Davis won, that would just be tilde G, right? Or Gray Davis did not win, again, tilde G, or it is false that Gray Davis won, tilde G. Then moving down to the dot, so a simple dot symbolizes conjunction. So conjunction, uh, the dot stands in for words like and, yet, but, however, moreover, nevertheless, still, also, although, both, additionally, and furthermore. And one thing you might note is while some of these words have a different grammatical function, like the words and and but, um, they actually serve the same logical function, so showing you that there's a conjunction that, um, and we'll talk about that a little more uh, on the next couple slides. The next symbol is the wedge, so symbol D on a keyboard. Uh, that stands in for disjunction, so words that that would stand in for are or or unless. The conditional, conditional statements, we use a horseshoe to indicate that. Note the horseshoe points to the left, so, and it always points to the left. And that will stand in for words like if, only if, given that, provided that, sufficient condition for, and necessary condition for. Now, depending on what words the horseshoe is standing in for, that will make a difference as far as what appears on the left or the right of the horseshoe. But again, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Finally, we get the biconditional. So the biconditional is like an equal sign with an extra line, so the triple bar. And the biconditional, uh, the triple bar stands in for phrases like if and only if, or is a necessary and sufficient condition for. All right, so let's uh, look at the each of these a little bit more in depth. So first we'll look at the tilde, so negations. So, California does not allow smoking in restaurants. Again, there's a simple statement in here. That simple statement is California allows smoking in restaurants. And then we're going to need something to stand in for that not. Or it is not the case that, or just in this case, not, right? So, remember, you know, right at the top of the screen, we see that if tilde stands in for not. So it'll be tilde, and then we'll have the simple statement, California allows smoking in restaurants. So we might choose C for that. So tilde C. Dell Computers is not a bank. Again, we could choose uh, the letter at the beginning of the subject. So D, and then it is not the case that, right? So Dell is not a bank. Simple statement, Dell is a bank, not the case. So tilde D. Finally, it's not the case that Dell Computers is a bank. So again, we'd have tilde D. Now note with all of these examples, the tilde occurs before the letter for the simple statement. So even if the not appears in the middle of the sentence, or if it is not the case that occurs at the beginning of the statement, the negation when we do our symbolizations, the tilde goes before the letter. It is false that Dell Computers is a bank, again, until they do. All right, so moving on to our next operator, conjunctions. So, former President Clinton idolizes Thomas Jefferson, and former President Reagan idolizes Alexander Hamilton. So here we have two statements. Uh, former President Clinton idolizes Thomas Jefferson. Second statement is former President Reagan idolizes Alexander Hamilton. And we see that word and, and we recall that a dot stands in for the and. So here we could have C dot R. And that shows you the C statement and the R statement. So the and, the dot, occurs between the things it's bringing together. Another example, former President Clinton idolizes Thomas Jefferson, but former President Reagan idolizes Alexander Hamilton. Now, as I said, we see that, 
or, or you might already be thinking, those sentences seem to be saying something different. Um, the first one's highlighting that they both uh, idolize someone, and the second one is drawing attention to the difference between who they idolize with the word but, right? Even though that's the case, that they serve a different grammatical function, they serve the same logical function. In order for the first example to be true, both sides would have to be true, that Clinton idolizes Jefferson and Reagan idolizes Hamilton. Similarly here, in order for this whole statement to be true, the first statement would have to be true and the second statement would have to be true. So we symbolize them the exact same way, C.R. And another uh, similar example, Clinton idolizes Jefferson. However, Reagan idolizes Hamilton. Again, we do C.R. And this is an interesting example. So former presidents Clinton and Reagan raised funds to build a presidential library. Now here again, we have two statements. Clinton raised funds to build a presidential library. That's one statement. Reagan raised funds to build a presidential library. And then we have the logical, uh, the logical term and. So we'll substitute for that a symbol. So again, we would get C dot R. So you can see how if you have a compound subject, you'll automatically need a dot somewhere. And if you have a compound predicate, you'll need a dot somewhere. Moving on to disjunctions. So Walmart expands retail globally or Kmart expands retail globally. Two statements, Kmart expands retail globally, Kmart, or sorry, Walmart does and Kmart or Kmart does. So two statements brought together by this word or. We recall that the symbol for or is a wedge. So for here we get W wedge K. Similar example, Walmart expands retail globally, or Kmart does. Now note our two statements here. One is Walmart expands retail globally. The second statement that these words stand in for, it says Kmart does, but what does does mean here? Here the does stands in for expands retail globally, right? The, the language is sort of referring back to something earlier in the statement. So we'd get Walmart expands retail globally or Kmart expands retail globally, which would make it just like the first example. So we'd get W wedge K. Another similar example, either Walmart or Kmart expand retail globally. So here again, we have the compound subject, Walmart or Kmart do something. Um, and we have this word either. We'll see, we'll talk about this word either later on. It'll, it'll um, serve a more complex function later on, but right now it's just drawing your attention to one or the other. So again, we do W wedge K. And finally, unless, so unless Walmart expands retail globally, Kmart does. Now, the wedge we said stands in for or and stands in for unless. So you might think here that it'd be wedge WK, but the wedge, like the dot, it will always go between the things. So the dot brought things together. The wedge is like an either or. The wedge will go between uh, the, the things that it's disjoining. So in this case, again, we get W wedge K. All right, so much for uh, the real easy ones. Now we get to one that's a little bit tough, conditionals. So conditional, the horseshoe stood in for conditional statements. So here we have a nice, uh, nice old example for you. There used to be these places where you could go rent video games, physical brick and mortar stores where you could rent video games and uh, videos like movies, VHS tapes. Um, Blockbuster and Hollywood video. So the example here is if Blockbuster raises prices, then so does Hollywood video. So again, two statements. The first one, Blockbuster raises prices. The second statement, Hollywood video raises prices. There we see that word does uh, again, right? So how do we bring these together? Well, the way we do it with a conditional statement 
is with a horseshoe. So if B then H, we'd symbolize that B horseshoe H. So the part after the if is the part that goes before the horseshoe. The then part is the part that comes after the horseshoe. So B horseshoe H. Now let's look at some complications. Blockbuster raises prices if Hollywood Video does. Recall that we've talked about the pieces of conditional statements before. The part that comes um, after the if in a regular if-then statement is called the antecedent. The part that comes after then is the consequent. So in the first example, Blockbuster raising prices, that was the antecedent, and the consequent was Hollywood Video raising prices. So the antecedent always goes to the left of the horseshoe. Now, in this example, we get Blockbuster raises prices if Hollywood Video does. So the part that comes after the if, again, is going to be the antecedent. So if Hollywood Video raises prices, then Blockbuster raises prices. That's what this sentence is saying. So the way we would symbolize that is H horseshoe B. Again, the antecedent, the part after the if, going before the horseshoe and the consequent coming after. So remember that rule. Wherever you see an if, the part after that is the antecedent, with an important exception. And here is the exception. So uh, here's the example. Blockbuster raises prices only if Hollywood Video does. Now, the rule I just told you was whenever you see an if, what comes after that is the antecedent. The exception to that rule is if you see an only if. If you see an only if, then what comes after the only if is the consequent, not the antecedent. So here, the antecedent would be first and consequent after the only if. So we get uh, if Blockbuster raises prices, then Hollywood Video does. So we get B horseshoe H here. I'll talk a little bit more about that, uh, why it's like that in class. All right, let's look at some other terms that indicate conditional statements. So Blockbuster raises prices provided that Hollywood Video does. So provided that is similar to just saying if. So Blockbuster raises prices if Hollywood Video does. So we would... Uh, we would symbolize that in the same way that we did as if the if was right in the middle. So when you see provided that, just think if, right? So whatever comes after if and whatever comes after provided that, that's going to be the antecedent. A different case is implies that. So Blockbuster's raising prices implies that Hollywood Video does. When you see the word implies that, you can think of only if, or you can think of then, right? So either of those indicate that what comes after those phrases is the consequent, and this example is like that. So Blockbuster's raising prices implies that Hollywood Video does. We get antecedent implies that consequent. So B, horseshoe, H. Now, on the quiz, there's going to be an example of a conditional statement. You can refer back to these slides about conditional statements to double-check your answer. In the first chapter, we talked about sufficient and necessary conditions. We recall that the antecedent was said to be a sufficient condition for the consequent, and the consequent was a necessary condition for the antecedent. I gave an example. If I have $5, then I have at least $4. Having $5 is sufficient, but not necessary for having at least 4 And having at least 4 is necessary, but not sufficient for having $5. So event A is said to be a sufficient condition for event B whenever A is all that is required for B. So having $5, that's all you would need to have at least $4. You wouldn't need any more than 5 to have at least four. Or having the flu is a sufficient condition for feeling miserable. So uh, having the flu is enough to feel miserable. There are other things that could make you feel miserable, plenty of other diseases, 
or just feeling bummed out, that can make you feel miserable. But having the flu is certainly enough for feeling miserable, so we can say that's a sufficient condition. Now, we recall that sufficient, the sufficient condition is the antecedent. So um, here, if we had A standing in for having the flu, we could just as easily have F. We can have whatever we want, right? If we have A standing in for having the flu and B for feeling miserable, then we'd have A horseshoe B. If we had F standing in for flu, we'd have F horseshoe and M standing in for miserable, M. So F horseshoe M. Now, necessary conditions. Event A is said to be a necessary condition for event B whenever B cannot occur without A. So an example, having air to breathe is a necessary condition for survival. So you have to have air in order to survive if you're a human, right? So if A is a necessary condition, and we recall that the consequent is the necessary condition, then this would look like B horseshoe A. And again, when you get to the quiz questions, you can refer back to these slides. All right, the last uh, thing we'll look at in depth before you get to some practice problems are biconditionals. So we just looked at conditional statements, the horseshoe. Now we're looking at biconditionals, so uh, a couple different conditionals in one statement. So take this example. A team wins the Lombardi Trophy if and only if that team wins the Super Bowl. So that's saying a couple different things. A team wins the Super wins the Lombardi Trophy if that team wins the Super Bowl, and a team wins the Lombardi Trophy only if that team wins the Super Bowl. And we recall that what comes after if is the antecedent, and what comes after only if is the consequent. So what comes after if and only if? Well, what comes after if, if and only if the antecedent and consequent are actually interchangeable. So in this case, we get L triple bar S. And that's equivalent to writing a team wins the Lombardi Trophy if that team wins the Super Bowl, and a team wins the Lombardi Trophy only if that team wins the Super Bowl. So it's like saying this in one neat uh, statement and one neat symbolization. So the first conditional, if L, then S, and if S, then L. So that's what the triple bar stands in for. Another way of saying this would be to say, a team winning the Lombardi Trophy is a sufficient and necessary condition for that team winning the Super Bowl. Now, a sufficient condition is the antecedent. So in that case, a team winning the Lombardi Trophy would be the antecedent, so L horseshoe S. But it also says it's a necessary condition, and the necessary condition is the consequent, so then we get S horseshoe L. Put them together, and you get L triple bar S. All right, so try out some examples yourself. So these eight problems, take time, pause the video, do these eight problems yourself, try to symbolize these statements, and uh, I'll give you some time. So I'll pause a little bit uh, in my speech. You can pause it then. Do these eight by yourselves, do the symbolizations of them, and when I come back, I'll let you know the answers. All right, so number one said, Russell Westbrook is not the best player in the NBA. So to symbolize that, we see that word not, and we can use R to stand for Russell Westbrook is the best player in the NBA. So here we just get tilde R. Number two, Steph shoots threes well, but LeBron does not. We recall that this word but, a dot stands in for the but, so here we get S dot L or excuse me, S dot tilde L. So uh, the simple statements here are Steph shoots threes well, LeBron does. So Steph shoots three well, threes well, LeBron shoots threes well. They're joined by but, and then we also need to get a tilde in there to capture the not. So here we get S dot tilde L. So the Steph shoots threes well, but, so the dot, and 
uh, LeBron, it is not the case that LeBron does. So S dot tilde L. Number three, either Kevin Durant or Isaiah Thomas is good at posting up. So here we have either or, so we know that's a wedge. So Kevin Durant is good at posting up or Isaiah Thomas is good at posting up. So K wedge I. For both Steph and Clay can shoot the lights out. So Steph can shoot the lights out and Clay can shoot the lights out. That'll be S dot K. Five, if the Warriors win the championship, then Brian will be happy. So we have an if then statement. So that's going to be a horseshoe. And the antecedent in this case is the Warriors win the championship. So W, horseshoe, and then the consequent, Brian will be happy, B. So W, horseshoe, B. Six, LeBron James is as good as Michael Jordan if and only if the Cavs beat the Warriors. So there we have an if and only if, so that's a triple bar. So we could do that L triple bar C. Seven, the Warriors will win given that Steph is the best player on the court. There we have that phrase, given that. So we know that indicates a conditional statement, so there'll be a horseshoe there. But now we recall from uh, the slide about conditional statements that given that indicates antecedent. So what comes after this phrase, given that, will actually be the antecedent. So Steph is the best player on the court, will be the antecedent, the Warriors will win, the consequent. So S, horseshoe, W. And finally, the Cavs will win only if LeBron is the best player on the court. Again, we see only if indicates a conditional statement. And what comes after only if is the consequent. So here we'd have C, horseshoe, L. Hopefully you got all of those right. If you didn't, go back and take a look at the slide and uh, hopefully you can figure out where you went wrong. So now let's look at uh, a problem that uh, arises. So look at this sentence. Look at this uh, sentence. Bob is cool, but Joe is awesome, or Rhonda is rad. Here we have three simple statements. Bob is cool, Joe is awesome, Rhonda's rad. And we have them joined by familiar terms, which we know, uh, we know what symbols stand in for them. So if we were going to symbolize it just how we read it, then it'd be B dot J wedge R. But now there's an issue here. The issue is that there's two ways to interpret the sentence and two ways to interpret the symbols. And um, the difference is really important. The first way we might interpret it, we might think this the statement is saying Bob is cool and Joe is awesome, both of those things. And if those aren't the case, then Rhonda must be rad. So both of the first two things, or on the other hand, Rhonda is rad. Or the other way it could be interpreted is Bob is cool, and one of the following is true. Either Joe is awesome, or Rhonda is rad. So the two different ways again, both Bob is cool and Joe is awesome, on one hand, or Rhonda's rad on the other. Or the other way of interpreting interpreting it, Bob is cool and one of Joe is awesome or Rhonda is rad. So why is that a problem? Uh, well, we can imagine a scenario, there's at least one state of affairs where interpretation one is true and interpretation two is false. So imagine the following case. Imagine that Bob is not cool Joe is not awesome, but Rhonda is rad. So then recall the first, look back at the first interpretation. Um, there we had Bob is cool and Joe is awesome on one hand, or if those aren't the case, then Rhonda is rad. And here we have Rhonda being rad. So that statement would be true because it was Bob and Joe on the one hand, or Rhonda on the other, and Rhonda is rad, so this statement would be true. But then look at the second interpretation. Bob is cool, 
and one of the following, Joe is awesome or Rhonda's rad. Now this way of interpreting it, we would need Bob to be cool for this statement to be true, but Bob is not cool, so that statement would not be true. So this is a problem. There are two different ways of looking at the, at the statement, and, and in certain conditions, one would be true when the other is false. So we need to figure out a way to indicate which interpretation somebody should be going with. Um, luckily, there are some hints in English, in written English, to, uh, to figure out which, which interpretation is right. And we have some tools in our logical toolkit to help us disambiguate between these two meanings. So the first set of tools will be parentheses. So parentheses allow us to group uh, a state, a couple of statements together to show that they, uh, they fit together. A way we can figure out where parentheses should go is one, one helpful tool is by noticing punctuation. So look at this example. If we have Bob is cool, comma, but Joe is awesome or Rhonda is rad, then we see the Bob is cool before the comma that goes by itself. And the Joe is awesome or Rhonda is rad, that will be grouped together. So the comma can set off uh, these pieces. So the way we'd show that Joe is awesome or Rhonda is rad goes together is we group them in parentheses. So that would make it clear that Joe is awesome or Rhonda is rad, those go together, and then Bob is cool, that's sort of by itself on the other side of the conjunction. Now if you have the comma in a different place, Bob is cool but Joe is awesome, or Rhonda is rad, then we'd see the B for Bob and the J for Joe, those are going to go together. So we're going to put parentheses around the B and the J, and then the OR R will be left out. So sentence structure can also help determine where the parentheses are. So take the following example. Bob is cool, but Joe or Rhonda is rad. So here again we have three statements. Bob is cool, Joe is rad, Rhonda is rad. But note the Joe, Joe and Rhonda share a predicate, right? It's a compound subject leading to the predicate. So the Joe and Rhonda here are going to go together, Joe or Rhonda, that's going to go together with Bob on the outside. So we get B dot parenthesis J wedge R close parenthesis. And if it was the other way, Bob and Joe are cool, or Rhonda is rad, again we get Bob and Joe sharing a predicate, so we get the parentheses around B dot J, and then the wedge R will be on the outside. Finally, words like both and either can help. So very often the words both and either will open a parenthesis. There's one exception and an example in the text. We'll see if you can catch that in class, in our next class. But um, very often they'll open a parenthesis. For example, Bob is cool and either Joe is awesome or Rhonda is rad. So that either tells us here's the beginning of a disjunction and it'll be the first disjunct until we get to the or. So Bob is cool, B dot, and now we get the either. So either very often opens a parenthesis, in this case it does, opens a parenthesis and then we get the J wedge R. And both serves a similar function. So if we got both Bob is cool and Joe is awesome, then we would see that B dot J, that will have to go together, or Rhonda is rad, that's going to go on the outside. So the both tells us we're starting a conjunction, and everything before the and is the first conjunct, and then uh, what comes after the and, that will be the second part. So B dot J in parentheses, or R. All right, so having learned that, again, try some examples on your own. Try 9 through 12. Uh, I'm going to stop talking, and you can pause the video and try these by yourself, and when I come back, I'll give you the answers. So you can pause me now.
So uh, the first one, Draymond will win Defensive Player of the Year only if Kawhi and Rudy falter. So we see this term only if we recall that that's uh, a horseshoe. So, and we know and it's going to be a dot. So we'll have D horseshoe K dot R, but now we need to know where the parentheses will go, right? We see that Kawhi and Rudy, they share a predicate. So K dot R, that's going to be in the parentheses with a D first. So it'll be D horseshoe open parentheses K dot R. And number 10, Kerr wins Coach of the Year, and either Steph wins MVP or Kevin wins MVP. So we have K dot open parenthesis S wedge K, where the either tells us where to open the parenthesis, right? So where the disjunction starts. So K uh, and, so that's a dot, and either opens the parenthesis S wedge K, and then close parenthesis. 11. Either Kerr wins Coach of the Year and Steph wins MVP, or Kevin wins MVP. Now here we have sort of a weird construction. We have either, and, and then we get to an or. Um, so when we see either, and then we, we see an and after our first simple statement, um, we're still hanging on for the second part of the d disjunction, right? So either, like I said, often opens a parenthesis. Here it does. So we get parenthesis k dot s, close parenthesis. That's one side of the disjunction. And then we get wedge k. So either, that's open parenthesis, Kerwin's coach of the year, that's k dot Steph wins MVP, that's s. And we got to close that parenthesis. Because that's all the either part, that's like on the one hand part, and then we get the wedge, K, uh, for the or part. Twelve, Steph setting a new record for threes is a necessary condition for him winning MVP again. So, we know that necessary condition indicates a horseshoe, but now we need to know what goes on the left side and what goes on the right side. Here it says Steph setting a new record for threes is a necessary condition, and we recall that when something is said to be a necessary condition, that's actually the consequent. So here, Steph setting a new record for threes would come after the horseshoe. So here it would be M horseshoe S. All right, so we have parentheses, which will help us disambiguate some complicated sentences. The other tools we're going to get are brackets and braces. And once we're done with these brackets and braces, we'll have all the tools that we need in our toolbox to symbolize all the sentences you're going to run into in this chapter. So brackets and braces um, are the next biggest grouping unit. So it goes parentheses, brackets, and braces. Just like it does in English, if you're using parentheticals, if you're stacking parentheticals, you use parentheses for the smallest group, brackets for the bigger group, and braces for the biggest group. Um, let's see how that might work. So again, punctuation can help us. So here we have, if Steph is chill, then Bob is cool, but Joe is awesome, or Rhonda is rad. And here we have uh, some new punctuation. We have the semicolon. So the semicolon is a bigger break than just the comma. So what comes on one side of the semicolon, it'll be a hard break between what comes uh, behind it. So here we have if step is chill, semicolon. So an if we recall is a horseshoe, right? If then is a horseshoe. So of S horseshoe, and then all the rest is going together. Bob is cool, but Joe is awesome or Rhonda is rad. So the smallest unit here, the things that will go immediately together are Joe being awesome or Rhonda being rad. So I'll have J wedge R in parentheses. And then going out to the next, uh, the next phrase, Bob is cool. Um, so we'll have B dot parentheses J wedge R. And then, if Steph is chill, coming on the outside. So it'll look something like this. S, horseshoe, 
then we open the bracket to show if Steph is chill, then all of this stuff follows. So if Steph is chill, then Bob is cool, and like either Joe is awesome or Rhonda is rad. So um, here the punctuation helped show us how to symbolize this. The comma showed us that the J or R were together. The semicolon showed us that everything after Steph is chill, that's all grouped together too. So the smallest grouping here are the parentheses. We move out, we get the brackets. Another example, if Steph is chill, then Bob is cool. Semicolon, but Joe is awesome or Rhonda's rad. So note the way the difference between this sentence and the previous sentence is the difference between the comma, the placement of the comma and the semicolon. So remember, the semicolon is a harder break. So the two sides of it, those will be um, separated. So the first part, if Steph is chill, then Bob is cool. That's all going to be together. And on the other side, we'll get but. So the dot will be between these phrases, right? Joe is awesome or Rhonda's rad. So it'll end up looking like this. If Steph is chill, then Bob is cool. That's all together on one side of the semicolon. But, so that's the dot. And then Joe is awesome or Rhonda's rad on the other side of the dot. So these are importantly different, right? The first one saying, if Steph is chill, then all the rest follows. The first one saying both, if Steph is chill, then Bob is cool. And either Joe is awesome or Ron does red. Sentence structure again can help. Take a look at this example. We're getting, we're ramping up in complexity. It is not the case that if Steph is chill, then Bob is cool but Joe is awesome or Rhonda is rad. So here we have the exact same sentence as the first sentence we looked at on this page, with the exception that we have an it is not the case that before all of it. So here, this sentence is saying it is not the case that, all that stuff in the first sentence, right? So here we would need a brace, we need a next biggest unit of grouping. So it is not the case that, and then all of the rest of what we put in that first symbolization. In the chapter, it'll talk about the main operator. Here, the tilde would be the main operator. It's the thing that's outside uh, all parentheses, brackets, and braces. But we'll talk about that in class. Another example, if Steph is not chill, then Bob is cool, but Joe is awesome, or Rhonda is rad. So here, um, we note the difference in where the not is. In the first sentence, we had it is not the case that if, and then all the rest of the stuff. Here we have if step is not chill. So the negation is just negating the Steph being chill. It's not saying all of the following is not the case, like the earlier example was. And that difference will be noted in our symbolization. So it is not the case that S, if not S, then all the rest, right? Finally, again, words like both and either can help. So we could see an example like if Steph is chill, then either Bob is cool and Joe is awesome or Rhonda is rad. So we get, again, uh, well, not again, importantly different, we'd get S, horseshoe, and then we'd open the bracket, open parenthesis B dot J, close parenthesis, or R, close, uh, close the bracket. So there we have if step is cool, or sorry, if step is chill, comma, and then all the rest follows, then either, so either opens a parenthesis, Bob is cool, and Joe is awesome, so we can't, so we can close the parenthesis now, because that's all going to be the first, uh, the first disjunct. So either both of those or Rondo's red. And all of that will be together inside the brackets. All right, finally, I know this is a long haul. You can take a break anytime you want. So we get to some special cases. Um, special cases dealing with negation. 
Take the following example. Davis is not governor and the governator is not governor. So in this example, neither one of them is governor, right? And we see the and that joins them. So the simple statements here, Davis is governor, the other statement, governor is governor. So um, both of those are negated and they're joined by an and, so joined by a dot. So unsurprisingly, our symbolization would be tilde v dot tilde g. So both of those are not the case, right? Davis is not and governor is not. Now, this one is importantly different. Not both Davis and the governor are governor. So here in here we have not both. And recall that I said both the words both and either. Generally, they're going to open a parenthesis. Um, but let's talk about the sentence again. So not both of them are governor. Here, at least one of the two of them is not governor. But one could be. Right? One could be, or the other could be, or neither of them could be, but what we know is not both of them are governor. So again, the word not, we know that's a tilde, both generally opens a parenthesis, and then we have that dot in there. So it'll look like this, tilde, open parenthesis, d dot g. Then either Davis is not governor, or the governor is not governor. Here we have an either or. Um, generally, either will open a parenthesis, but here it's not important. The parenthesis isn't important. But let's talk about the sentence. Here at least one of the two is not governor. So either on the one hand, Davis is not, or governor is not. So we get tilde D wedge tilde G. So either not D or not G. And that's exactly what the sentence was saying, right? But then if we have the not going before the either, then it'll be really important that we open up the parentheses. So in the last one, the parentheses would have gone around everything. It would be either, so parentheses, tilde D, wedge, tilde G, close parentheses. But we don't need parentheses there because the parentheses wouldn't add any information. But now look where the parenthesis would be here. Here we get not either Davis or the governor is govern, governor. So here we get similar to the second example where it said not both. Here it says not either. So here neither one of them is governor, right? Not either of them is. So we'd get tilde, open parenthesis, and then D uh, wedge G. Yeah, we'll see this phrase too, and this will be, I think, the last slide before you'll, uh, I'll turn you loose on some more examples and then the quiz. So here we get neither Davis nor the governor is governor. When you see this word neither, what I urge you to think of is, a, it, it's a contraction for not either, right? So just like the last example where we had not either Davis or governor as governor, we had tilde, open parenthesis, D, wedge, G. That's exactly what I'd have you do here. So the standardization or the symbolization that I'd have you do is the bottom left one, uh, tilde, open parenthesis, D, wedge, G. Um, note that that's actually equivalent to saying both not Davis and not governor. That, that's equivalent to saying not either of them is governor. So you could either say not either of them is governor, or you could say Davis is not and governor is not. They're saying the same things. They're saying neither one is, right? So those two, sim those two symbolizations are actually equivalent, but again, I urge you to use the one on the left, the first translation, because it makes uh, it's a shorter step, not either, just tilde, open parenthesis. And then when you get to the or, that's when you'll drop the wedge. All right, so uh, go ahead and do these final examples here, and then we'll get to some quiz questions. Uh, again, I'll shut up so you can pause it, and you can do the, and then I'll explain the answers afterwards. So you can pause me now.
All right, so for number 13, not both Steph and Kevin will win MVP. So there we had a tilde, and then the both opens a parenthesis, and S dot K. So tilde open parenthesis S dot K. 14, both Russell and LeBron will not win championships. So there we get both, which would open parenthesis, but let's see if we need it. So this is saying Russell will win a championship and LeBron will win a championship. Those are our two statements, but both are negated by that word not. So here we get tilde R dot tilde L. And the both would tell us there's a parenthesis around the whole thing, but we don't need a parenthesis around the whole thing because tilde R dot tilde L is perfectly, there's only one meaning for it right? They're both not going to win. Um, all right, so 15. It is not the case that both Russell and LeBron will win championships. So it's not the case that they both will. That's going to be different than 14. 14 said they both will not. 15 says it is not the case that both will. So there are different conditions that could be the case and this still be true. Um, Russell could win a championship while LeBron didn't. LeBron could win the championship while Russell didn't. Or they both could not win. The only thing that couldn't happen is that they both win. So this, it is not the case that both LeBron, Russell and LeBron will win championships will be tilde, open parenthesis, R dot L. And that's exactly what we'd, and then close parenthesis. And that's exactly what we'd expect given the order of the words, right? Tilde, for the it is not the case that, both will open a parenthesis and then R dot L. 16, neither Steph nor Kevin are cupcakes. So here again, I told you to look at the word neither as the contraction of not and either. So we get tilde, open parenthesis, S wedge K. And 17, either Steph is not a cupcake or Kevin is. Um, here, the either would open a parenthesis, but we don't need it because uh, we'd get tilde s wedge k, and that's there's only one interpretation of that. Steph is not a cupcake, or Kevin is. So tilde s wedge k. And finally, we get to the quiz question. So for the quiz questions, um, on your piece of paper, write down what the symbolization of these three statements will be, and then uh, you'll have to answer the multiple choice questions on the quiz on Canvas. So number one, Jordan being the greatest is sufficient for LeBron not being the greatest. How would you symbolize that? Two, either Steph had the greatest season ever or the Pope is not Catholic. How would you symbolize that? And finally, LeBron will be MVP if and only if neither Steph nor Durant stays healthy. So figure out how to symbolize that as well. And complete the quiz. And I'll see you next time for 6.2.